Okay, well, welcome to uh, Key Insights. Uh, we're here today uh, reviewing uh, presentations from the uh, Great Debates Meeting in GI Cancers in New York City. I'm Dr. David Ilson uh, from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, Axel Grothy from Mayo Clinic, Arizona. So I think it's been a really uh, exciting uh, session today, uh, reviewing updates in the treatment of colorectal cancer, where we've reviewed uh, novel therapies uh, targeting immune pathways, uh, biomarkers uh, such as RAF mutation in colorectal cancer, and the issue of the optimal duration of adjuvant treatment in colon cancer. Maybe we can start with that as the initial topic. Yeah. So, you know, the question of optimal duration of therapy and uh, adjuvant therapy in colon cancer is tied to the toxicity of oxaplatin-based therapy, which we all dread in some ways. I mean, we all use oxaplatin, but if we have a fixed, you know, kind of a duration and we try to achieve, let's say, 12 cycles of Folfox, 8 cycles of Kpox, um, pushing patients sometimes into neurotoxicity, that's not great. Because we know only a fraction of patients, probably 7%, really get cured from oxaplatin-based therapy. Two-thirds of the benefit comes from the fluoropyrimidine. But we subject every patient to the toxicity of oxaplatin-based therapy. And those toxicities can be experienced lifelong. You know, I have patients, you know, who uh, really have long-lasting neurotoxicity. So eventually, we, it, as an international consortium, the so-called IDEA collaboration, international duration evaluation in adjuvant therapy, we uh, ran a large, probably the largest cooperation ever in, in colorectal cancer. 12,834 patients were included, randomized to three months versus six months of therapy, either using Falfox or Kpox. There was some randomization. And we saw in a non fioriti analysis of all the patients combined that the non fioriti margins were not met. You know, so the trial in its overall patient population was negative. Having said that, the trade-off, and this is informative for our clinical practice, a three-year disease-free survival is only 0.9%. And you cannot even put a laser pointer between the disease-free survival curves. So the question is, how does this translate into our approach now? particularly when we now broken, uh, break down subgroups, the different regimens we use, Kipsidem, Oxaplatin versus Folfox, and the different risk groups, high-risk versus low-risk tumors. And starting with the more clinically intuitive risk groups, T1 to 3 and 1 tumors, which by themselves have a better prognosis, about 80 plus percent, three-year disease-free survival. There are clear data that you, for the overall patient population, you do not need to use more than three months of therapy even more so when you use Kipsidem and Oxaplatin compared to Folfox. For the higher risk group of patients, there is potentially a trade-off, in particular when you talk about T4 tumors. Um, so that's something we need to discuss with patients. Um, so there could be a tendency toward longer therapy, but I still believe, you know, from a clinical perspective, you could even stop Oxaplatin after three months and then continue with the fluoroprimidine. Yeah, I think the key take-home messages uh, from the IDEA analysis, and this is your publication coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine, is that um, for low-risk patients, N1 disease patients, three months of capecitabine oxaliplatin is, is absolutely acceptable. It's not inferior. In higher-risk patients, N2 disease, six months of therapy was shown, uh, um, the three months was not shown to be non-inferior. However, the difference was quite trivial. It was like 1.9%. Yeah. So I think the take-home message is low-risk uh, patients, N1 disease, three months of capecitabine oxaliplatin is acceptable. For higher-risk patients, uh, although six months of therapy uh, may be preferred, uh, the difference was relatively small, and three months of Kpox could be considered. Yeah. But, the, but also that the Folfox regimen behaved uh, less well, that uh, there was no demonstration of, of um, uh, that we should use either three months or six months of Folfox. I mean, we shouldn't use three months of Folfox in either low risk or high risk patients. So, yeah. so uh, if we're going to use Folfox, it should be used for six months. But uh, Kpox is acceptable for low risk patients for three months. And then we have to discuss with patients the very small benefit for extending capecitabine oxaliplatin out to six months, which turns out to be less than one or two percentage yeah. points. <clears throat> I think that's one of the issues. You know, when we, we now have data that can actually serve as framework for discussion with patients. Now, what did you make out of the BRAF story, BRAF V600E story? Well, I think we now have positive data, even from a randomized trial, uh, that combining uh, a, B, a BRAF inhibitor, uh, an EGFR antibody, and chemotherapy uh, uh, improves uh, response, progression-free survival, and trends towards a survival benefit. So 
I think uh, we have validated uh, the concept that we can potentially overcome EGFR uh, targeted resistance by adding agents that target um, uh, the BRAF pathway. And now we have interesting data even eliminating the chemotherapy, potentially yes. using a MEK inhibitor, a BRAF inhibitor, and an EGFR antibody. So I think this type of treatment is going to move forward. And now a use of a BRAF inhibitor plus a EGFR drug and arenatecan in a BRAF, uh, a refractory BRAF mutant patient is now part of treatment guidelines. And the end guidelines, yes. Yeah. So I think uh, that's a really interesting area of uh, research. And we also heard some updates about uh, progress in HER2-targeted therapy in colon cancer, even though it's a very small subset. Yeah, uh, but HER2 is the next biomarker that we look at. We talk about RAS mutation, BRAF mutation. We talk about MSI or mismatch repair deficiency, sightedness. And, but I think HER2 amplification is probably the next biomarker that will make inroads into guidelines and clinical practice. I know you're probably testing for it. We're testing for it because we have trials available. Actually, there are several trials available on a national level. Um, and I believe, you know, that this is the next biomarker in colorectal cancer that should be tested. Yeah, well, I think uh, HER2 seems to be a marker of resistance to EGFR-targeted therapy. But uh, the data for uh, combination therapy, particularly trastuzumab plus pertuzumab, shows a clear signal of activity in refractory HER2-positive patients. And there are other HER2-targeted combinations, as well as this one now in phase three randomized trials. So it's yeah. very exciting. So a big part of our meeting today came uh, focused on immunotherapy. And I think we saw an excellent session today. And I can only encourage everyone, you know, if you want to experience these sessions, come to New York next year. You know, this is a great uh, way to interact with uh, the faculty. It's a very interactive session. So I really enjoyed this session. We learned a lot. I mean, biomarkers for immunotherapy. Uh, why, is, why do MSI high mismatch repair deficient tumors respond without even PDL1 anti uh, PDL1 expression levels? Um, so, what is your takeaway of this, David? What, what do you think were the highlights here? Well, I think that uh, MSI high status now uh, has led to uh, approval for anti PD1 therapy for any chemotherapy refractory solid tumor that's MSI high. So there's a clear signal of activity in colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer, cholangiocarcinoma, esophagogastric cancer, that if the patient is MSI high, uh, that patient has a good chance of responding to anti-PD-1 therapy. And based on that, we now have regulatory approval for these drugs. I think the next wave is uh, uh, looking at combination immunotherapy in these patients, a provocative data that perhaps Ipilimumab plus nivolumab may result in higher response rates and potentially better progression-free survival compared to nivolumab alone in MSI high colon cancers. Also, the concept, because uh, we know that obviously most tumors are microsatellite stable and have a lower mutational burden, are there ways that we, can we make the uh, immune environment more hot and more immunogenic? Um, and ongoing interest in using MEK inhibitors to upregulate uh, IHC uh, expression and um, uh, HLA expression and potentially make a tumor more immunogenic. So we're awaiting results of the randomized trial in microsatellite stable cancers comparing conventional uh, late line treatment with um, uh, a combination of atezolizumab plus uh, cobimetinib, which is a MEK inhibitor. Yeah. And a lot of interesting uh, 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 new drug development, uh, these bispecific antibodies. Uh, combining an antigen, uh, like a, a targeted antigen antibody that recognizes CEA, which is very commonly present in many cancers, and linking that to an immune stimulatory component that can recruit and activate T cells. And some very interesting early data suggesting that these bispecific antibodies may result in uh, interesting and potentially durable responses. So a lot of uh, interest in um, uh, immunotherapy combinations, trying to make uh, non-immunogenic tumors immunogenic, using these bispecific antibodies that allow the, the um, uh, antibody to hone in on the target, but then uh, recruit an immune uh, uh, response. So a very exciting time, and uh, I think this is going to be an era of further uh, uh, new drug development, and uh, I think uh, many exciting things coming down the pike. Yeah, but I do believe we need to be careful. These new agents have toxicities. You know, we talked about CATCB, you know, the bispecific antibodies we see inflammatory reactions to the cancer, which we want. We want to make these tumors hot. But on the other hand, these tumors get inflamed. There are side effects related to that. 
pneumonitis in patients who have lung metastasis, liver um, inflammation, you know, hepatitis, and actually pain in patients with extensive liver metastasis. So sometimes I'm a little bit concerned moving drugs from phase one to phase three right away, you know, where you spread it out there and we don't really know exactly what toxicities we should be handling in which way. So I think, you know, this is something which I hope will not affect the validity in the future, let's say, you know, the use of these agents, because again, immunotherapy can have toxicities. We need to learn how to deal with that. Yes, and I think uh, lastly, um, two very interesting debates that uh, rounded out the day. One was in rectal cancer, the issue of uh, preoperative chemotherapy and radiation followed by surgery versus uh, reserving uh, surgery only for patients that don't achieve a complete response. So there is a potential role um, in patients that achieve a clinical complete response in rectal cancer with preoperative chemotherapy and chemoradiation. If they've achieved a clinical complete response, there may be a s uh, potential to defer or avoid uh, rectal uh, surgery in those patients. So a very active debate about who are the appropriate mm -hmm. patients for this, but at least it's coming into the discussion and the dialogue that this might be a treatment option for selected patients and uh, this is gonna be the subject of ongoing clinical trials. But it's not easy to run these trials because you know, randomizing patients to an APR versus no yep. EPR if you have a clinical complete response, I mean, that's hard to do, at least in our environment. I know there are ongoing trials elsewhere, um, but right now we rely on more registry data, retrospective analysis, observation of it. And you know, it's probably as good as it gets. And I do believe once we, once we have established a clear follow-up guideline schedule, like you have at Memorial, you know, how to follow these patients with a clinical complete response, non-operative management, and then go to salvage surgery when needed, you know, I think that's a very important, because we don't want to miss curative ability. So what, what did you think about the Y90 discussion about liver metastasis? Yeah, I think um, uh, the data are fairly convincing that upfront use of this technology combined with chemotherapy did not Im improve a survival benefit over chemotherapy alone. So my, uh, I think we're gonna need, uh, and certainly some yttrium is approved to treat uh, liver uh, confined metastasis and uh, it seems that the role of this therapy probably is gonna be more appropriate in later line therapy. Yeah, I agree. But to bring it up first line with its attendant toxicities and expense, it, uh, at least with the current data that's available, it may not be And with uh, large data sets, I mean, it's not trivial. I mean, yes. there are more than 1,000 patients. Yeah, no clear survival yeah. benefit, and it's not sure does, you know, enhance liver control if you don't see a survival benefit is that clinically right. meaningful. So I think we've covered a lot of the key insights into what happened today, the great debates and updates in GI oncology. We focused on colorectal cancer first. It's our first day it was heavily weighted toward colorectal cancer. Um, and there's more to talk about at a later time point. Great. Thanks very much for joining us today.